Hey, this is Ethan Sawyer, sometimes known as the college essay guy. My goal is to bring more ease, joy, and purpose into the college application process. Welcome to the College Essay Guy podcast, where it's my job to interview the most brilliant minds in the college admissions and education world, analyze their genius, and break it down for you into practical, actionable steps that you can take whether you're applying to college or helping someone else apply. In this case, it might be considering, is college even the right place for you? This is the second of two episodes on homeschooling and self-directed learning. My guest is writer, speaker, and fellow podcaster, Blake Bowles, whose work invites students and families to reevaluate the traditional schooling model. Are the typical high school and college experiences really the best ways to spend your time? That's what Blake asks. We'll discuss on this episode, can you really quit high school and not like totally ruin your life? Why is this the best time ever for self-directed learning, in Blake's opinion? How can we all be more self-directed learners? And why should you Google everything, email strangers, and find your nerd clan, the benefits of skipping college, or at least taking a gap year, how to know if you're making a decision for you and not your parents, and again, just a fair warning that listening too closely to this episode could mean that this is the very last College Essay Guy podcast episode you ever listen to, and that could actually be a very cool thing. My guest today is Blake Bowles. He is the founder and director of Unschool Adventures and the author of The Art of Self-Directed Learning, Better Than College, and College Without High School. He hosts the Off-Trail Learning Podcast, and he's currently working on a new book. Blake, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ethan. Great to be here. I'm so glad you're here. So I'm curious about the new book. What's the new book on? Uh, the working title is Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? Question mark. And I'm trying to get parents who are already thinking like maybe my kid is not a good fit for school to then just take the next step and and leap into a, a more radical form of alternative education instead of sticking with the system that's not really working. And so this is my first book written directly for parents. My first books were written for young people. Is this is this a kind of book that would be relevant for even parents who are considering this? Or is this for students who maybe have tried sort of the conventional route, we'll say, and have found that it doesn't work for them? It's definitely relevant for someone in your situation. And, uh, you know, there are some people who believe that if if you think your kid's not a good fit for school, keeping them out of, of primary school is the most important thing you can do. And, and if, if they go through sixth grade, then they're irrevocably damaged somehow. And I just, I really don't believe that. I've met so many young people who have figured out that they should take an alternative path in middle school or high school, some even in 11th grade. Like they're about to graduate from a, a really good school and they're like, I'm just, I can't do this anymore. And they leave for their senior year. And so I, I don't think any time is too late. And, and you're starting at, at the perfect time because your, your kid's about to go into school. You got to make the hard decisions. <laughs> that's how I feel. Uh, and that's part of what inspired, you know, me to come to the homeschooling conference where we met. So just to give the listener a little context, I'd heard a little bit about Blake and about his work. I checked it out online. There are so many resources. We'll be, you know, sharing a few of those and there'll be stuff on the podcast page, the show notes page where you can see all that Blake has been up to, but there's just a wealth of stuff. And I was delighted to, to meet Blake in person and we chatted just briefly and I was like, Hey, can you come on the podcast? And he's like, sure. I do podcasts all the time. So here we are. Um, let's set context, Blake, what is self-directed learning and, and how did you first get into thinking about it? Sure. Uh, self-directed learning to me is really about consent, which I think is something we're going to touch on again later. And so it can be structured. It can be unstructured. A lot of people think it means totally unstructured learning. If, if there's a curriculum, if there's a class, if there's a teacher, if there's any sort of imp, you know, imposition on a young person, then it's not self-directed. I, I disagree with that. I think that a lot of what self-directed young people do often does not involve a curriculum. But you can choose, you can you can fully consent to take on really hard, really structured stuff. And that's what most of these young people do, even though they don't have curriculums for most of their lives. They still, the majority of them go on to college and careers and, you know, highly structured stuff. So self-directed learning is consensual learning in my book. And I did not grow up in an alternative education environment. I went to public schools in Central California and ended up going to UC Berkeley uh, to study math and science, specifically to study astrophysics because it sounded extremely impressive. And I thought that because I did well in math and science in high school, that I should just do that and be like a research scientist. 
And I got about halfway through a degree and then realized that I really didn't love math or like real science, like the real hardcore physics enough. And I thought, well, I, maybe I could be a high school science teacher. And then I started reading books by like teachers who had taught in the public and private systems for a long time and gotten super frustrated. And, and the most important person for me in that regard was John Taylor Gatto, the, the New York City public school teacher who won New York uh, City Teacher of the Year three times in a row and New York State Teacher of the Year twice in a row. And, and in 1991, when he received both of those awards for the second time, he quit teaching and he wrote an op-ed to the Wall Street Journal saying he no longer wanted to make a living hurting kids anymore. And he started writing and lecturing about what he saw as the, the fundamental deficiencies of the public school system and, and the private school system, pretty much all conventional school systems. And I read, I stumbled upon one of his books and that was the beginning of the end for me. And I ended up uh, designing my own degree in alternative education. And so I had a very self-directed, a very kind of unschooled second half of college. And I still graduated with a bachelor's degree, uh, albeit you know, the, the least marketable degree in the history of UC Berkeley, because I named it myself and it, it was called Alternative Schooling and Science Education. And, and really the science education part, that was BS. That was just me, you know, trying to justify having two years of science on the books. Uh, so uh, th that was my that was my gateway into this world. And since then, I've been working uh, in w with teenagers who don't go to regular school in a variety of different programs, uh, some of them my own programs and some of them other people's programs. One of the things that you shared in your presentation that I found really interesting was this screenshot of the 12 action themes of Gatto's guerrilla curriculum. And I'm going to I'm going to read these because I just want to sort of you know just it's in terms of like sort of setting context for folks and giving some themes that we might be talking about uh, speak these aloud and then I also am interested to hear are there a couple of these that there might have been light bulb moments for you in terms of your journey, early journey, getting into self-directed learning. So uh, one of these is substantial community service. Another is apprenticeships. And by the way, these are cost-free methods to restore primary experience and intellectual quality to schools. That's how this is framed. So we've got substantial community service, apprenticeships, parent partnerships on school time, team projects like gardens, cross-age tutoring, talent shows, food co-ops. We've got independent study, work slash study, including starting a business, mentorships, solitudes like fishing, hiking, contemplation, silence, etc. Adventures or discoveries like mapping, exploration, meandering, challenge, etc. Field curriculum like furnishing an apartment, shadowing an employee at a job site, uh, analyzing characteristics of good and bad swimming pools. And then we've got improvisational play in groups without guidance. And then the 12th one is flex time, flex space, flex sequency, and flex text selection. And I know that in a little bit, we're going to get into some of these in more particular, but were, were any of these as just as you're hearing about them, because you've heard about these, I'm sure, bunches of times before, were there any of these particularly meaningful to you as you first started thinking about self-directed learning or really getting into it? What I like about this list is that it highlights pretty much all the parts of school which kids really love. It's all the extracurricular stuff. It's, you know, drama. It's uh, doing some sort of cool internship or apprenticeship if your school offers that. It's independent study. It's uh, going on an adventure, like if you get a chance to travel internationally with your school or if you get to go to maybe a competition or a conference somewhere else. That's the stuff that really stands out. And that's what stood out in my young life. Uh, I went to a, a summer camp in the mountains of Northern California. That was very life-changing. I went uh, to go live abroad in South America when I was 14 for about a month. And that was a, a super difficult Spanish immersion experience. And I remember growing and changing and, and learning, you know, learning Spanish or learning how to do at, outdoor skills so rapidly. And it was such a contrast to the typical day-to-day -day life in school, which was just slow, monotonous, bureaucratic, just a waste of my time and a waste of most other people's time. Uh, yeah, some kids get a lot out of school. I got some things out of school. It was not a complete waste, but it was just so inefficient. You just, you know, reading Gatto and reading about how he got his kids out of his middle school English classrooms and into the different parts of New York City, using New York City as a as the curriculum and uh, not, not, uh, he says, uh, this is how you restore intellectual quality to schools. 
And most people, when they hear that phrase, intellectual means academic, schools means you're inside a building. His school was uh, were the neighborhoods and the boroughs of New York. And intellect, uh, you know, this the academic analysis for him came after the primary experience. Kids need to experience real things, have real boundaries, have feedback, have people push back against them. And that just doesn't happen for most kids in school. It's just this big fake world. It's a giant game that we learn how to play. And it's a waste of most people's time. I love like you speaking to the inefficiency, especially as I've gotten older, really, as I look back on my high school experience, which was also a public high school experience. I felt that tension. And I, I think I like to say to my friends, I think the best class I took in high school was typing because it really taught me a tool that I've used <laughs> since, you know, a lot in my life. And I, I, the other thing I love that you're talking about is I love hearing you say New York City as a curriculum and thinking of the world and the, this, uh, you know, an urban environment, for example, as a curriculum. Um, that just really lands with me. So, the title of the talk you gave, I want to share with folks, it's, it was, yes, you can quit high school and everything will turn out okay. Blake, could this be true? <laughs> well, I'm biased. Uh, I think so. I think it is. Uh, I can't promise that it will be true for your kid or, or anyone's particular kid uh, because high school means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But what I get into in the talk is saying if your kid clearly is is struggling, but not just struggling like – you know, can't get an A instead is getting B's. It's more like has declining mental health is, uh, is not making friends is feeling like life is very pointless, uh, is feeling extremely bored. Uh, this is all a, a situation that, that doesn't have to be. And there are all these cool alternatives to school out there that range from radically alternative, like the democratic free schools where there is no curriculum, kind of kids get to run the show. They have an equal vote to adults on all matters of substance in the school. Uh, or you could have radical unschooling, which is where you're not just homeschooling, but you are, you are homeschooling without any curriculum. The child is driving the process. It's completely interest-led, parent-facilitated learning. Um, or you can you know, dial it back a bit. And there are uh, various uh, private and public options that just give your kid a little bit more choice, a little bit more flexibility, you know, it kind of takes uh, some of the pressure off. And those are great too. You know, not every kid needs complete and absolute freedom uh, to, to design their own learning experiences. And a lot of kids, they'll cycle through different levels of, of self-directedness. And so for a little while, you know, being homeschooled with a curriculum might be the right thing. For a little while, unschooling without a curriculum might be it. And then they might, you know, really want to be around a group of peers. And so going to an alternative school or a self-directed learning center becomes the right thing. And so, uh, yes, you can quit school and you need to replace it with something else. And there are, this, you know, entire ecosystem of choices out there. And very few of us know about them or we instantly stereotype them into, you know, homeschooling equals uh, they don't, they don't know anything about the world and they're unsocialized or alternative school equals, well, it's a private school. So therefore it must just be for, for rich to privileged kids. And it's, it's, it's so much better than that. We are, we are living in the best time and place in North America ever in the history of history to have alternatives to mainstream school and alternatives that still lead kids to college and career and, you know, normal, functional, self-sufficient adulthood. I want to follow up. Why is this the best time ever for students and parents to be considering bringing more self-directed learning into their lives? So you can just um, compare what we have right now in the United States or Canada or a couple other countries that are really great examples to what we have in other countries at the same moment in history. And in other countries, um, homeschooling is often not legal or it's ambiguously legal or it is legal, but just not many people do it. And so it's not really a great option uh, beyond having very young children uh, where kind of every parent is a homeschooler by default. Uh, and so your choices then become public school or private school. And private school is usually a lot like public school in the sense of you know what they do. And it just costs a lot more money. And so this is really – and if the, if the public school is not a great option, this is just mm, – there's no good way out here. And so what we have in the U.S. is we don't just have public schools and then private schools that look a lot like public schools and cost more money. We do have those, but we have more than that. We have this whole array of schools that are less conventional, ranging to the 
to the radically unconventional. And a lot of these schools do not charge twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars a year. They charge something closer to five or ten thousand dollars a year, and they have sliding scale tuitions because the people who start these alternative schools are extremely generous. And, and you know they should be charging more money, but they're not because they they care about accessibility. Uh, and in addition to that, we have homeschooling uh, as free and legal options in every single state in the U.S. in every province in Canada and and many other countries as well. And this only happened in 1993. There was this coalition of you know fundamentalist Christians and then back to the land hippie parents that came together in the 70s and 80s to fought. And they fought state by state to make homeschooling legal. So now you can go uh, live anywhere in the U.S. and you can file paperwork with your uh, – it depends on what state you're you're in. But you can very easily choose to homeschool. You pay nothing. You will uh, face a small amount of oversight depending on where you are. If you're in like New York State, your kid will have to take a basic standardized test every few years to make sure they're not you know, completely inept. I think they have to score above the 33rd percentile. And then uh, in other states like California or Texas, there's no requirements whatsoever. You literally can do whatever you, you want uh, with your kid. And that's that's a wonderful freedom. A lot of people are kind of scared of that because they think of how it can be abused. And that's, that's a reasonable thing to be afraid of. Um, but by and large, again, I, I haven't seen some great crisis of uh, parents abusing their homeschooling freedoms. And so that's why we're in the best place and we're in the best time because there's there's a plethora of options and it you don't have to pay a lot of money to participate in the world of alternative education. Blake, who can benefit from self-directed learning? I I was just talking about this with a friend here in New York the other day. Uh, uh, It's kids who are not that interested in playing, uh, pardon my French, but like stupid bullshit hierarchy, social hierarchy games, like the popularity games of school where it doesn't matter. uh, It doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you're on top of everyone else. Uh, The the kids who I think gravitate towards team sports are generally not the ones who become unschoolers. Uh, So I think, yeah, there's a certain level of like being weird, being, you know, a freak or a geek that leads kids to, to go in this direction of alternative education. But also it's the kids who are really genuine about learning and they want to learn. They want to build skills. And, and unfortunately that's not the culture that is present in most schools and especially middle and high schools. Learning is not taken seriously. If you prioritize learning, that that is a liability to your social standing in that school. And so there's a lot of kids who are just like, I want to do real stuff. I don't want to wait. I don't want to play these ridiculous games. And so how do I do that now? How do I do that without waiting until I'm 18? And those are the kids who end up in these alternative paths. Yeah. The things that are pinging as you're sharing are things about like, you know, building skills and you didn't quite say this, but this is kind of what I bring is like, you know, connecting to their values or figuring out what their values are. Right. And, you know, exploring their curiosity, all things that humans should be doing in life. And what I hear you saying is like, there are ways in which the traditional education system is not (laughs) necessarily the best way to help us help students do these kinds of things. And there are other ways of doing it. And what I'm also holding in my head is that there are probably some folks listening and going like, well, but for whatever reason, you know, circumstances or, you know, life, I can't homeschool my kid or I, my, you know, my, as a a student listening, I can imagine saying, well, I I can't go to, I can't homeschool. Well, I'd love to hear, because what I'm hearing also is that self-directed learning isn't just for homeschoolers, that there are actually some principles and some things that we can learn uh, that are applicable to other folks. Am, Am I, am I right in that? Uh, definitely. And and to quickly respond to the many parents who say, I can't homeschool because, you know, both of us work or I, I'm a single parent or just no one is around. That's where self-directed learning centers in alternative schools enter the picture. That's a way that your kid can uh, do something that's way more personalized for them. That's way less stress, less anxiety and be around a large group of their peers. And, and they're out there. Go go Google the Sudbury schools the agile learning centers, the liberated learning centers, democratic free schools, there's lots of them. Um, so it's not about homeschooling per se. It's about, it's about finding something that gives your kid some real uh, autonomy and choice. And there's many different ways to do that from school to unschooling. Share with us some ways that whether folks decide to go 
an alternative education route or not, how can we all be more self-directed learners? So uh, one of the things that that came up for me that I've already shared is, is that it's about learning by consent. And so this is applicable to adults also. And, and consent is this idea that most people wholeheartedly accept when we're talking about uh, the medical profession. You know, you don't want someone to just do surgery on you while you're unconscious. You, you want to, uh, to offer consent. Uh, you, uh, you want consent in your relationships. You know, if you have a, a, a child, you want to make sure that, that they know what healthy consent looks like. If you have a, a partner, a spouse, you know, you of course want that to be a consensual relationship and systems of governance. We don't, we want to be represented. So con- consent is this like broadly, uh, appealing concept until we get into the realm of, of education where somehow we think it's okay to throw it out and you can't give kids a, a meaningful choice in how they spend 12 or more years of their life. Um, and yet th- this is something that we do understand as adults. And so that's, that's more about taking something that you understand as an adult and bringing it into the, the life of your children. Um, and I'd love to hear some examples. So give me an example and let's do maybe one inside the classroom and outside the class. So what is a non-consensual learning experience? And this may be yeah. obvious for folks, but I want to do that. And then I'd also love to do it in terms of like the parent perspective. So not only, you know, how do teachers non-consensually teach, but also what are some alternatives in terms of the parents can be using with their children? Sure. So I think a a common example outside of the classroom uh, is sports and also music. And and so if you want your kid to take a music lesson, you will figure out, okay, hey, would you like to try piano or guitar or I don't know, (laughs) samba, drama, I'm just making up stuff now. And you give your kid options. You say, hey, how about you try it for this amount of time? You know, I will I will be on your team. I will invest in some lessons. I I will maybe get you a uh, an instrument or I will support you in being part of this band. And then you, you let your kid try it. You encourage them to try it for a reasonable amount of time. So they've given it a real chance. And then you ask them, Hey, do you want to keep doing this? And then you respect their answer, whether it's yes or no. And this is how we treat music. This is how we treat sports teams, you know, outside of the most, you know, fan- fanatical parents who say you, you must play the violin or you must be on the football team. Uh, that's not a non-consensual way to, to approach those topics. Um, Within schooling, or to give an example where where a, a parent you know has a choice about about helping their kid approach education consensually or non consensually, um, I'd say that first of all, there's a huge you know chasm in between K through 12 schooling and college you know higher education schooling, because college is by by choice. No one is being forced to go to college, uh, whereas we have compulsory schooling laws for for kids up through age 16. And so I think that this is why the the K through 12 system is is you know perpetually in a state of crisis. You know when has it never been in a state of crisis? I I don't know. And and why higher education, while it it has its own you know unique problems and challenges, is not you know, considered to be uh, in perpetual crisis. In fact, people from all over the world come to America to participate in our higher higher education system. And I think the, you know, just the most basic difference is you choose to go to college and you don't choose to go through K through 12. Great. So what are some other ways that we can become more self-directed learners and or inspire our students to be more self-directed learners? Something that a lot of people are aware of already in the realm of psychology is this concept of intrinsic motivation. You know, I'm, I'm sure any educator has, has heard of this and cause it's, it's a basic and important idea. You know, people can do th- things for their own sake. That's intrinsic motivation, or they can do things because they want to get a reward or they're, they're afraid of a punishment. That's something you do out of intrinsic motivation. And the basic ingredients that go into intrinsic motivation are uh, autonomy, which means having a sense of choice, having options, uh, mastery, which is the ability to go deep into something, to develop some real skills. And the last one is relatedness, which you can kind of, kind of think of as community or purpose, a sense of belonging. And those three ingredients are, are what you know, can inspire someone, what will, what will provide the raw materials for someone to, to work on something completely for its own sake, including something very difficult. You know, we, we ask ourselves, how do people, you know, who are doing these crazy PhD programs 
in some super esoteric fields. You know, how do they motivate themselves to get up and go to a library and pour over all these books? Uh, you know, it's not because they're going to go and make a bunch of, of money. Let's imagine this is like a, a liberal arts PhD, okay? It's not because it's for the money. It's not because it's for the glory. Uh, you know, there's something that's happening there that has to do with them having a sense of, of freedom and choice, um, them getting really, really good at something, because that feels good to everyone. We, we've, when we've sensed, you know, I think it was Nietzsche who said, you know, happiness is feeling your power increase. And, and that can be power in the form of, of knowledge and talent. Um, and then finally, feeling like you're a member of some sort of, of community. It could be a, like an academic community in this sense, a, a community of scholars. That's what motivates someone to get up and, and just pour over dense texts in the library for 12 hours and then try to write some you know, horribly long dissertation. And so we have to be asking ourselves, how do we provide these ingredients of intrinsic motivation in the, the educational environments for our kids? And, it, and it, all it takes is a cursory look to say that most school situations – um, outside of some some nice outliers, most school situations don't give kids much autonomy. They don't give kids a chance to go deep into a skill. They're they're forced to stay at the surface level and just learn a tiny bit about everything, and then you have to move on to the next thing. And then finally, um, you know, a good school will have a sense of community. It will feel like you have a purpose for being there. I didn't have that experience in my you know relatively well funded public school growing up in Bakersfield, California. And the only reason we were there is because we all lived in the same geographic, you know, the same zip codes. And uh, there was no real sense of, of, of togetherness. And it was nothing like what I felt when I went to a summer camp. It's nothing like what I felt when I went off to college and I met other people who were studying the same things or who shared my same interests. Uh, and so I, I really, I think summer camps in particular are a wonderful model of how you can take a kid who might seem lazy or unmotivated in some other context and you take that same kid and you put them into this new context and they will work really hard on something and often surprise their parents in you know how dedicated they become they became and it's simply you know intrinsic motivation explains it right there and, and that ties in with with our sense of of what discipline is also so I'm reading your book last night, and one thing that jumped out at me that I'd love for you to share a little bit about is the Google everything part. Why should students Google everything? Yeah, I think that in our collective uh, adult anxiety about smartphones and the internet and the YouTube algorithm whole, I, I think that it's really easy to just say, you know what, I grew up without technology, and, and I turned out fine, and so put your damn phone away. And, <laughs> and, uh, you, you don't need it for learning. And I'm like, no, no, I, we've already lost this battle and the technology is here to stay. And we need to go the other direction and embrace it because, it, you know, to Google something is to tap this, this collective outsourced hive mind, which is, which is the future, you know, that we are there already and we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be per like, kind of hate myself for, for saying it this way. We shouldn't be preparing our kids for a future where, uh, where information is considered scarce, which is the, the most, you know, most of history. And, um, one of my favorite authors who has written about this is Will Richardson, who's a former public school teacher and administrator. Now he does a lot of teacher training stuff. And he has argued in, in his writings for not just having open book tests. So we're talking about still the, the realm of conventional school. He's trying to get conventional schools to become a, a little bit more self-directed. He says, we don't just need open book tests. We need, we need open phone tests. You know, let your, the kids have their phones and Google the answers. And essentially, if a kid can easily cheat and, and game your test, you, the test that you're given as a teacher with their phone, you have not created a high enough quality test. Yeah. You know, that is the new bar. I think that's freaking genius. I really do. And yes. Yeah. There, and, it's, and so, oh, it's, I'm so excited to, sh I want to jump in and interrupt for a second and say that I, I went yeah, to yeah. this talk recently where the, the guy was sharing Wolf from Alpha and he was saying, you know, it, we've, we've basically technology has evolved such that we're, we're, our education system is so far behind. And if we just caught up and started changing the way that we're thinking about, like, you don't need to like actually learn to memorize all these formulas. If you've got something like Wolf from Alpha, where you can just type it in and it's not only going to tell you what the answer is, it's going to tell you, it's going to show all the work. And so what we need to be teaching is like teaching students. And this is what I hear you getting at is like how to find the information they're looking for. And and may, yes, maybe we could test for that, but maybe that's, I don't know, is that the most interesting test? 
And, and what you just said connects to what a lot of, of kind of mainstream economist literature is now saying about the future of jobs and the future of work. One of my favorite writers is Tyler Cohen, and his book Averages Over essentially says, okay, there's this big difference between um, you know, people who are still earning essentially the same median wage adjusted for inflation that, that they did in the 1970s, and then the people who are making gobs more money. And he said the difference between these two broad groups of people is that one knows how to work with, with computers and software and smart machines. It's like w they work with the machines, and the other one is competing against the machines. And he says it's only going to go one direction here. You have to learn how to work with the machines. And so what you just said about Wolfram Alpha – uh, is is that's a great point. It's like, do we have to learn how to do all these these math equations in in a very uh, you know eighteenth century manner when you can have a computer do them for you? And, and a lot of people say, but what if the computer doesn't doesn't work anymore? It's like, yes, true. Uh, and and if a lot of other things fail in our civilization, we're going to be screwed also. But assuming that that we can continue pushing forward, then then that's the next level. You you don't do something that a computer can do for you. Like to to prepare kids to think in a way that we're that they are competing with with software, they're competing with smart machines is just economic, you know, sabotage. Yeah, and it's, it's it, for everyone involved. And and students don't have to do this alone, right? It's not like it's the student alone with the machine, right? They're harnessing the power to like reach out to to your point earlier to community and create larger communities and using technology is making that easier than ever. Talk to me about why students should email strangers. Emailing strangers is the complement to Googling everything. Uh, learning how to Google, how to use search terms, how to find all that static information that's out there on the internet is super important. But there's all this other information which is locked up in people's brains, you know, information about the direction that a certain job industry is going, uh, you know, how you work through a certain problem in a certain field. Uh, there's all this stuff that you can't Google, and that's why you need to be part of the, the social world. And... Uh, but what happens with, uh, I guess, the assumption that we have with school is that kids can only hang around other kids their age, plus or minus a couple years. And it's not appropriate for kids to be communicating with adults. I call bullshit on that. I think that, that kids have always been interested in what adults are doing. And right now, they're the most closed off from, from the adult world that they've ever been in, in history. There's just uh, no easy way for young people nowadays to get exposed to what adults are doing in their day-to-day -day, uh, life. And for uh, many, of, you know, many different reasons, some of them involving liability, some of them involving the fact that it's a lot of knowledge work now instead of hands-on work, which easily lends itself to apprenticeships. But emailing a stranger is a way that a teenager can quickly get a view into the world of work. And I think that that's what teenagers are largely interested in. They do want to become effective adults. Talk to me about nerd clans. This is a pretty basic one. I think that you, uh, you cannot be expected to form instant or tight relationships with people just because you are thrown in a common jail cell with them. And sorry if that's a strong analogy, but I think that's essentially what's going on in school, or at least that's how it feels to a lot of students. And instead, people, um, they form deep bonds when they're allowed to to form affinity groups, when they when they center around interests. You know, even that's, I think, the power of sports teams. Again, it's, it's consensual. And so I don't have uh, uh, almost any friends that, that remain from high school. Um, I have a number of good friends that have come from my college years, and I think by far my closest friends and, and my most numerous friends have come from the worlds of summer camp, because I've, I've spent a lot, a lot of time working at these two different summer camps, and the world of education. And I think this is what a lot of adults you know, eventually realize is um, <laughs> you need some common ground with other people. And so this is what I mean by by nerd clans. You just need to find the other people who are really nerdy about the things that you're nerdy about. And and that's where you you form tight connections. That's where you feel that sense of belonging, that sense of purpose, which is important for intrinsic motivation. So your other book is Better Than College, How to Build a Successful Life Without a Four-Year Degree. Now, I love that, you're, that we're bringing this onto this podcast, which is all about ostensibly getting into college and going to college. <laughs> is it possible to build a successful life without a four-year degree? I know it's kind of a layup question, but, but talk to me about this. <laughs> 
uh, yes, Ethan, it is possible. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the young people who end up choosing, like very purposefully choosing not to do a four-year um, program, in my observation, are those with interests in the arts, in the skilled trades, in tech, entrepreneurship, uh, those who really want to travel and they want to do a gap year or maybe two gap years and get some real world experience. And then they might even go back and they you know, will continue to do higher education and end up with a degree just a little bit later than normal. And so that book is mostly about questioning the, the unquestioned, the almost secular religious path that we have nowadays towards, towards uh, salvation, so to speak, which is getting uh, a four-year degree and, and perhaps even uh, you know, more degrees beyond that. And so I profiled a lot of young people who did grow up alternatively educated, homeschooled, unschooled, alternatively schooled. And, and they went on to do what a lot of parents just think is the nightmare scenario. They didn't get a high school diploma and they chose not to go to college. It's like they just must must be complete screw ups, right? And and no, I, I that in the book I explain uh, through both stories and through um, and through you know facts and figures why that's not the case. Why the arguments that we commonly hear for the the value of a four year degree can be extremely skewed, even if they're they're correct in the aggregate, and why you know those numbers uh, really shouldn't affect an individual's decision to the extent that we have, we have let them, um, guide individual decisions. And this is all way, way more salient when we're talking about a young person who's going to take on student loan debt. So uh, I'm, I'm one of those lucky, uh, people who went to a really high quality public university before all the tuition hikes around the recession. And so, uh, you know, I was paying about $8,000 a year for tuition at, at UC Berkeley and plus uh, room and board experience uh, expenses. And, uh, and I had a parent who could pay for that outright. And so uh, certainly lucky, certainly privileged in that sense. Um, and that takes a lot of the pressure off if you don't have to consider debt. But this is all so much more amplified if you were a typical student who's looking at typical levels of student loan debt, which is somewhere on the order of $100,000 after all is said and done. So what are some good reasons to either skip college or let me say, uh, take a year off potentially and take a gap year. There's a book that was published in 2018 that I think really dives into this question, um, in a way that I never could. The book is called the case against education by the economist, Brian Kaplan. And, uh, essentially he takes all of the numbers about the, the return on investment uh, of a college degree, and he he parses them to like the tiniest level of detail, and he takes into account a lot of stuff that we don't talk about, which is, um, you know, when we say a college graduate earns a lot more money, uh, to what extent is does that reflect just the pre-existing, uh, you know, let's say to choose one statistic only, like in, intellectual talent, the IQ of um, of that person beforehand, you know, someone who can get into Harvard, but chooses not to go to Harvard is in all likelihood still going to do very well, uh, in, in the marketplace. And so you have to take out that ability bias first. Um, you have to consider the fact that, that, that parental resources, you know, money, wealth, that is a huge skewing factor. Also, um, you have to take into account the desired major because, just to choose, you know, the most extreme polar opposites here. If you're going to major in petroleum engineering, you're going to make so much more money than an early childhood education person. That's just, I, I even read a recent article saying that, that study majoring in early childhood education will actually cause you a, a net loss in your future earnings compared to just having a high school diploma, uh, you know, considering the cost of college that you will incur along the way. Um, horrible, surprising statistic. And so, that book can really dive into it. And, and just to give you the, the, the top level recommendations that came out of that book, which is based on a bunch of peer reviewed literature. Um, it's not that surprising, actually. It's if you're an extremely, um, kind of motivated student in the, in the realm of academics and you're planning to go into the realm of academics, then you should probably go to college. I know that kind of sounds like a tautology. It doesn't really mean anything. But you should be like wildly enthusiastic about the prospect of spending a lot of time with books, discussing ideas, working with abstractions, and writing papers. I'm, I'm talking about 
you know, the general four-year liberal arts path here. And uh, to maybe bring this down to another level, the, the author Derek Sievers has this this great, uh, you know, decision-making matrix. He said, "There's there's yes, there's no, and there's hell yes. And in this case, you don't want your college decision to just be a yes or no decision. Um, you should actually probably stick to, to no as your default decision until you find that situation, which is a hell yes. And, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, I guess kind of easy advice to follow. Um, but you have to, to be able to parse your expectations and desires for college from your parents' expectations and desires and the larger culture's expectations and desires and this giant, you know, incoming wave, which is your peer group, uh, which is, you know, all these other people around your age who are also going to college. And they're also talking about, you know, whatever the U.S. News and World Report ranking of the schools they're going to. These are all extremely hard things to, to, to figure out and to differentiate when you're 18 years old. And, and so essentially, if you are unclear about why you're going to college or why you are choosing to study the thing you are studying, there's a very good case to be made for waiting. A question that's popping up for me is I imagine being 16 years old and hearing you say, hey, separate your thoughts and feelings about college from your parents and from societies. Mm -hmm. and it makes me go, if I'm a 16 year old, like, how do I do that? Like, how do I know that I'm making a decision that's for me and not based on these? Because I imagine that it feels blended for a lot of folks. How do I? How yeah. does a student know? Is there like a practical way? Are there questions that students can ask? About Ugh, that? It's it's hard. It's so hard. It's that there's no easy way to get out of this trap. And I, I think that that people who do choose alternatives to conventional school are much better equipped to do that kind of thinking because they can see that oh my god, I'm not doing what all the other you know kids my age are doing, and I still seem to be doing fine. I'm not a complete screw up. Uh, and so I think that, that that helps. But again, not many young people are taking alternatives to the conventional path. And so reading, obviously, is is one way to do it. But uh, most kids are so busy with schoolwork and homework that there, there's not much time left over for that, especially after, uh, you know, Minecraft and Fortnite, uh, you know, investments have been made. <laughs> so I, I don't have a good answer for that one, Ethan. I, I don't know if anyone does. Um, I, the one takeaway I, could, I can imagine offering at this moment is – talking really seriously about the economics of student loans, yeah. um, with, with your kid and, and not brushing that over, not saying, well, it's an, it's an investment in education. Therefore it's always a good investment. That's bullshit. And if you're telling your kids that you are potentially sending them up for, for a real crap situation as you know, in their twenties. And, and so it's worth looking into books like, like Brian Kaplan's The Case Against Education. It's worth um, you know, looking at alternative college ranking systems, the alternative to U.S. News and World Report. There's, there's lots of good alternatives. Um, and it's worth looking at the, the crazy little colleges that, that don't uh, make the headlines, you know, the, the little uh, you know, private liberal arts schools, the ones that are, that are super small and and you know only take 200 people there's even there's even smaller ones i have a friend in portland who's starting uh, who has started a two year college called the wayfinding academy and they're trying to flip the college experience and and i, I couldn't even get into the details about that I, I interviewed the director on my own podcast but um there are all these little alternatives in the realm of higher education to the the big well known um public state universities and the Ivy Leagues and in the same way that there are many alternatives that, that most people don't know about in the realm of K-12. to This is awesome. I want to flag a couple things. One, if you're hearing Blake talk about U.S. News and World Report rankings and you haven't heard my other podcasts where I've talked about those, if you just Google your annual reminder to ignore the U.S. News and World Report rankings, there's a good article on that. <laughs> um, and if you're interested in some of those other possibilities, I'm just going to cross-reference one of my podcasts, um, uh, with the one with Maria Furtado on colleges that change lives. There are a lot of cool other schools there. Mm -hmm. And Blake, will you just, if you can remember the name of the podcast so that when folks search for it, the, of the Wayfinding um, interview, do you remember the name of it or the, the title of it? Yeah, the interview is with Michelle Jones and the school is called the Wayfinding Academy in Portland, Oregon. 
great. We'll link to that. Um, so I'm a huge resource junkie and I, I love, I know that you like resources and you have a bunch of them. Blake, will you point folks to some of your favorite resources for students, for counselors, for parents who are maybe excited about, interested in what you've shared so far and, you know, interested in learning more? I'd be happy to. It's a good thing we prepared some show notes for this purpose. It's a good thing um, we did. And you feel free good. to feel free to jump around on these. You don't have to say them all. Um, and folks, you don't have to write these down. Again, on the show notes page, you can find these. So okay. yeah, just maybe just highlight a few of these that you feel like are particularly, you know, ones that folks shouldn't miss. Sure. Well, I'll start by beating my own drum and saying that my uh, podcast, Off Trail Learning, we are, you know, more than 50 episodes deep now. And I do long form interviews kind of like you and I are doing with people in the world of alternative education, sometimes educators, parents, sometimes young people. And a couple of my favorite episodes, I recently had Ned Johnson, who's one of the authors of the book, The Self-Driven Child, which is also one of my favorite recent books about, um, it's not quite telling you to go to do all the radical alternatives. It's just saying, Hey, this is how your kid's motivational system works. And let's just look at how this interacts with school. Uh, they, they don't connect the dots, uh, as directly as I, I wish they would, but it's still a great kind of entry level book for parents who are starting to think differently about school. And so again, the self-driven child, that's the book. And I also interviewed, uh, Ned on my podcast and maybe one other, uh, favorite recent episode that I've done, I interviewed Peter Gray from Boston College, who has a popular book and a, a TED talk about the importance of play, of unstructured childhood play. And I talk with him about the evidence for self-directed learning. Essentially, is this field, you know, these alternative schools, unschooling, homeschooling, is this just something that 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 privileged people? do and they can afford to do it because their kids kind of can become screw ups and it doesn't matter because they have safety nets anyway? Or is there evidence that this is something that, that really works, that kids go on to, you know, career and college and, and all the stuff that we normally want for them? And he is one of the, the, the biggest authorities in the field who's done uh, primary research on this question. And so we dive into how much evidence is there for all this stuff, you know, real scientific evidence. Oh, what else? There's so many books out there. I mean, John Taylor Gatto, he uh, he passed away recently and he left a number of great books. His most popular one is Dumbing Us Down. Uh, the book that I got into in college was called A Different Kind of Teacher. That, that one's a little bit more out of print. If you can find it on Amazon, it's your lucky day. Um, another book is written by my friend Grace Llewellyn. She wrote the Teenage Liberation Handbook. And that was published back in 93, and it's written directly for teenagers. And, and she inspired me to write directly for young people also in my first and second books. And this is just like pure, like, like fire bottled up in the form of, of a book that tells teenagers, you know, you don't have to put up with this, this bullshit. You can, there's a whole world out there waiting for you and you can enter it tomorrow. And whenever I reread it, I, I still fall in love with it over and over again. Uh, and let's see, one more book that came out recently I'd like to highlight is um, is the book Unschooled by Carrie McDonald, who is a, it's an unschooling mom. And uh, it's not actually just about unschooling. It's a great introduction to the whole world of alternative education. And so if you were trying to, to figure out, you know, what are my options to try to get your bearings, I recommend um, you pick up that book. Let's see. A few blogs that I like. I already mentioned Will Richardson. Uh, he's got a blog and some some books that are excellent. And then one other blogger who's who's a bit controversial, a bit uh, iconoclastic, is is Penelope Trunk, and she is an unschooling mom. Her kids are pretty much grown up now, but she is a prolific blogger and she she writes stuff without a filter and she says stuff that no other uh, you know homeschooling mom blogger will say. And sometimes she ruffles feathers because of it, but I think more often she is spot on and she is especially good in discussing the question of, of video games and screen time. And she advocates for unlimited video games and YouTube. And so, you know, just, just go onto her site and search for those articles and she'll take you on a roller coaster. I, I love her for that. A few other books that have really shaped me, um, Excellent Sheep by William Duresowitz, which is all about the college admissions game. Uh, it makes the best case I've ever read for doing an unspecialized four-year liberal arts degree. Um, 
the book The Nurture Assumption by Judith Rich Harris, which argues that parents are way less influential on the outcomes of their kids than they think. That's a great way to to learn how to like relax and step back and stop being so controlling. Um, there's a new organization, it's a few years old now, called the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. And they are making a real effort to bring together all these different players in the world of, of self-directed learning and, and alternative schools. And so they have a great resource and, and they have a great online magazine too. Um, there's a couple summer camps. And so not back to school camp is the one I've spent the most time working with. That's, that's started by Grace Llewellyn, who wrote the Teenage Liberation Handbook. If you have a teenage homeschooler or unschooler, that is pretty much the place you want to be you know, each August or September is not back to school camp. Like you meet the coolest other teenagers and it's, uh, I, I, I could spend a whole episode just talking about, uh, that camp. And then there's another one, which is great for a little bit younger kids. I think they have teen programs also called camp stomping ground. And that's out in New York state. Uh, there's homeschooling conferences. There's unschooling conferences. Um, uh, and a few more of my own things include my company, Unschool Adventures. We've been leading long international trips for teenagers that happen during the school year. So anyone is allowed to sign up. But, uh, you know, it's more convenient if you're <laughs> a self-directed learner. And, and so I've taken groups to Nepal, Spain, Argentina, New Zealand, uh, Southeast Asia, all over the place. And, and I'm scheming an, an around-the-world trip for early 2020 that, that I'll personally lead. Blake, what are you most excited about when you think about the future of self-directed learning? Oh, that's a great question. And that's not an easy question either. What excites me is that I think we're going to be going in this direction whether we like it or not. I think that, that technology and economic forces are actually the main drivers of, of what we now call self-directed education. So, for example, why did homeschooling have this resurgence in the 90s and the, the early 2000s. I think it's largely due to the internet. I, I don't think there was you know, a, another equally powerful force that was responsible for these millions of homeschoolers kind of appearing out of thin air. And I think that, that we're going to continue going in that direction, especially with um, an economy that demands uh, more creative thinking, more knowledge work. This is the standard, you know, 21st century uh, skills uh, argument. And and I think schools will reluctantly uh, come along, kind of you know, dragging under their 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 heavy weight and, and their their bloated bureaucracy. But they will they will slowly move in that direction, while surrounding those those kind of dinosaur schools. There's this this you know these agile little little mavericks. And, and those are the little schools or learning centers or homeschooling co-ops or, you know, world schoolers. Those are the ones that I like to, to highlight and champion and be the cheerleader for. And so I feel like it's an exciting time because we have the momentum of history behind us. And, uh, and whether you like it or not, it's going to be a self-directed future. And, and <laughs> we're only getting started. Blake, thanks for coming on the podcast. Ethan, it's been a pleasure. Hi, friends. If your hand is cramped from writing down all the resources that Blake just mentioned, don't worry, because you'll find them, as always, on the show notes page. That's collegeessayguy.com slash podcasts with even convenient links. Fun fact, you can sign up for Blake's newsletter on his website, blakebowles.com, and get a free audiobook edition of his book, The Art of Self-Directed Learning, as if you didn't already have enough action items from this episode. On our next episode, I interview another advocate in the education world. He is Shane Winmeyer, the founder and executive director of Campus Pride, the nation's leading LGBTQ organization for student and campus organizations working to build future leaders and create safer campus communities. Hey, ever left a review of this podcast? If not, I'd really appreciate it. It helps me share this stuff with more folks. You can do it at collegeessayguy.com slash podcast. As my friend Giovanni would say, be easy, y'all.